little boy. Under than eight. Okay, come. How old are you? Seven. Yes, you follow me. Now, listen, please. In the 1840s, in Scandinavia, it was illegal to preach the gospel. They were claiming that Jesus would return in a few years. So the Spirit of God came upon little children. And parents would put them on tables. They would put them on chairs. And these little boys and girls would preach the gospel. And the hearts of the people were convicted. This happened in Denmark. This happened in Sweden. This happened in Norway. This happened in Finland. All of Scandinavia children preaching the gospel. Like in the days of Jesus. When they said, Hosanna to the King. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to him that cometh in the name of the Lord. They proclaimed the coming of Jesus to Jerusalem. Behold, these children were proclaiming the second coming of Christ. And the authorities could not put children in jail. They could put the adults. Many parents would put in jail, but not the children. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you very much. I want to show you something. What's your name again? What is the name? Patrick. Patrick. I have something in my pocket. Tengo algo en mi ¿Quieres sacarlo de mi bolsillo? They won't bite. No muerde. Okay. You know what that is? ¿Saben lo que es eso? What is it? What is it? It's a trumpet, that's right. Es una trompeta. In Hebrew it is called the shofar. Se llama el shofar. It's just on a ram. Like estaba encima de un carnero, no así, de esa manera. And I want to blow it. Y yo quiero soplarlo. Ese es el fuerte pregón. Gracias. Queremos estudiar sobre el fuerte pregón. A la luz del Espíritu Santo y la Biblia. Y los judíos tenían el día de la trompeta y el día de la trompeta. Yo he estado en la sinagoga en el día de la trompeta y la hace sonar. Y siempre dice, si lo ven acá, parece una mujer que está orando. Está orando, está postrada. To cry to the Lord, please save us, seal us. Don't put us aside. No nos dejen salado, en lado. And that prayer is the key. Esa oración es la oración. To receiving power from the Lord today and in the future. De hoy. To call to the people to prepare. Para hacer que el pueblo se prepare. We read in Romans chapter. Vemos en Romanos. In our text, Romans chapter 9, verse 28, that He will finish the work. It is God who will finish the work. And He will speak to His servants in a loud cry. It will be similar to the midnight cry. Have you heard of the midnight cry? It's not the same as the loud cry. But it is similar. We go to the book of Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 25, verse 26. I hope you'll take some notes. Matthew 25, verse 6. And I want to answer uh, two main questions. When is the loud cry? And two, what is it? Those two questions. We're going to limit our study to that. When is it? And what is it? When? When? Matthew chapter 25 verse 6 says, And at midnight there was a cry made, be Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. At midnight, this loud midnight cry. This was after the second angel's message. What was the second angel's message? Babylon, Babylon is fallen. So after the second angel's message comes a midnight cry. People were proclaiming that the Protestant churches had fallen. One of them was Charles Fitch. He published an article. 
in a journal, in a, in a newspaper of the Millerite movement, and he said, all these Protestant churches have fallen. It's a real powerful article. He says, you know, they're hypocrites. All these Sunday-keeping uh, Christians are hypocrites, he said, because they have slaves. He spoke out against slavery in America when there was slavery in the South of the United States. And he said, that is proof that all these churches have fallen. That is proof, all the other proof we have is that they have rejected the message that Jesus is going to return soon. In the 1840s, in the 1840s, it was proclaimed that Jesus was not going to come right away. They were expecting a thousand years of peace. And so God raised these men and women with this powerful message at midnight that Jesus is going to return. Some people call them the seventh month movement from March 21, 1844 to October 22nd, 1844. And it was in the summer that Samuel Snow came riding into a conference and he says, I got it, I got it. And they gave him the, the pulpit and he got off and he said, Jesus is going to come October 22nd. He mapped it all out and people just left that conference with a midnight cry, Behold, the bride will come. Now this message of the midnight cry was after the second angel's message. It is the same with the other angel's message. There's one difference between Seventh-day Adventists and Reformers. Seventh-day Adventists say, many of them, nominal Adventists, that Revelation 18 is still in the future. And in the reform, we hear people say, no, Revelation 18 is now. We are Revelation 18. You know, they're both right. But let us draw this parallel. Let us draw a parallel. Yeah. Okay, so you have the second... Angel. Tenemos el segundo ángel. Yeah, thank you. And you have the midnight y tenemos el, cry. El fuerte pregunta de medianoche. What does the second angel say? The churches have fallen, right? El segundo mensaje que Babilonia había caído. Do we agree on that? Estamos de acuerdo en que ha caído. Sí. Well, now we have the other angel. Ahora tenemos otro ángel. And we have a loud cry. Y tenemos un fuerte pregón. Well, they are the same, but they're also different. This midnight cry was part of the second angel's message. This loud cry is part of the other angel. You see, the other angel has three phases to it. You see the light. You hear the voice. And then you get the power. And this third phase is the loud cry. Just like in the second angel's message, it had several phases. And the last phase, the last phase of that second angel's message was the midnight cry. The last phase of the other angel is the loud cry. Now let's read it in the testimonies. And let's read it in the scriptures. Early writings, page 278. Early writings, page 278. And 277 and 278, it says, this message seems to be an addition to the third angel, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. Now, she says it's an addition to the third angel. So here is the third angel. And the other angel comes to help that third angel. But the last phase of this other angel is the loud cry. 
We read in early writings, page 278, I saw that this message will close with power and strength far exceeding the midnight cry. It's going to exceed the midnight cry, the loud cry. That's what she's talking about. It's in the chapter, the loud cry. This message seems to be in addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. Now, how was that midnight cry? ¿Cómo fue ese, ese, ese Joseph Bates noche? was Bates. a captain. Era un he capitán. had been a captain at sea, later capitán. became a farmer. He después sold his farm un, un and became a late preacher. Y después and many vendió in America did that. They would sell their predicado. farm, sell their possessions, and start to preach the gospel. Vendían todo y empezaban a predicar. They were really moved to say that Jesus was going to return. They were moved to say that the Protestant churches had fallen. The loud cry can only come after the latter rain. We're going to read in... Zechariah, please. Zechariah chapter 10. But that does not mean that Revelation 18 doesn't come till after the latter rain. Revelation 18 started in 1888 with the revelation of Christ our righteousness. And it's in these three phases. That's what we must understand. There are different phases. But let me cite another more powerful example. I speak to Jews. I, I've read rabbis. And they say they're why they reject Jesus. Because they cite all all these verses that say that when Jesus will return, Jerusalem will be at the head of the world. They say that he will rule all the nations. All the nations will be dominated by Israel. They read all the prophecies on the second coming of Christ and they ignore all the prophecies of the first coming. So they reject Jesus. The same thing with the many nominal Adventists. They say, you reformers, where are the miracles? Where is the latter rain? Where is your loud cry? You know, they're talking about the last phase of reformation. But they ignore the first phase. If you come with me to Jerusalem, you'll see the wailing wall, this big wall. And the Jews come there, and they're dressed all in black, and they have beards, and they have these black hats, and they're, they pray like this, you know, and they put their prayers in the wall, and they say, please, Lord, send us Messiah. Send us Messiah. We're waiting for Messiah. And we're Christians. We want to tap on the back and say, Brother, Messiah came. He came 2,000 years ago. You see, the Bible speaks of three comings of Christ. And you're only reading the verses of the third coming and the second coming. You're ignoring the first coming. The same thing with nominal Adventists. They read the prophecies of the crisis and they put everything in the future. Sunday law, just like many Jesuits do. They put everything in the future with revelation, you know? Everything. You're going to see these locusts that are actually going to show up, these monsters from genetic engineering with these tails of scorpion. They don't see the spirituality that all of that is in the past. Most of Revelation is in the past. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies of his first coming. He hasn't fulfilled it for his second coming. That does not mean that he is not Messiah. He is Messiah. And he will come. The reform has fulfilled the two phases. The light and the voice. It is called of God. Revelation 18 is here. Every angel symbolizes a group of people. The testimonies say that receive the message and share it. But there's different phases. Don't we have different phases? William Shakespeare said that every man goes through seven stages. And so is with the church. We go through different stages. So Christianity has gone through different stages. Now let's read this text in Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. And it reads... Ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. 
So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Since 1888, the other angels started. It is the time of the latter rain it can fall at any time. But realistically, when we read the testimonies, the sealing of the living in the church of God comes before the outpouring of the latter rain. The sealing of the living, the latter rain of the living, and with the latter rain, they have the power to do the loud cry, the last phase of Revelation 18. But it says, pray in the time of the latter rain. Now, there is a special time. In Israel, there were two rainy seasons, the early rain and the latter rain. Early rain was in September. They had two calendar years. One started in September, the other started in March. They had a civil calendar and they had a religious calendar. Of these two rains, the one in September and the one in April, or April, May, April, April rains bring May flowers, right? April, April showers bring May flowers. Thank you. April showers. Okay. So, it is the latter rain that is more powerful than the early rain when it falls. And it's necessary in order for the rain to be filled. Now, how do you know when you look at a field of wheat, if it's ready for the harvest? You know what the grain does? It turns. It bows. It bows. Literally bows. Like this. It just bows. As a symbol of humility, it is filled with fruit, with grain. And it just bows. So God's people, when we shall be filled with the Spirit of God, we will bow. We need to bow even now as we are filled with the Spirit of God. And he's, and as He gives us the time and the heart to pray, ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So give so. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone, grass in the field. You know, in the field of Canada, in the different fields of the United States and all around the world. When we read the testimonies, and I believe possibly Brother Jerry already quoted this. It's taken from early writings, page 85 and 86. It says, at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. Now, Sister White talks about two times of trouble, just like we speak of two comings of Messiah. There's a little time of trouble, which is the Sunday law, and there's the big time of trouble, which is during the plagues. And she explains this. She so says, the commencement of the time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out. It's not the plague. But a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. A short period. What did we read in Romans chapter 9 verse 28? That he will finish his work. He will cut it short. He'll do it quickly. Just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and nations will be angry. What is the greatest trouble that's going to come before the place? What's, yeah, the wars, but what's going to bring national disaster and international disaster? Sunday law. Sunday law is going to bring all the international disaster. That's right. Yet held in check so as not to prevent the work yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain, <coughs> the nations are angry, this little short time of trouble, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come. It's in that time it will come. There may be some showers before. Outpouring. 
says it will come at that time to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured Let's read a text, please, from the scriptures in terms of Ezekiel, please. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 15 and 16, it says, then said he unto me, As thou seen this, O son of man, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Ezekiel 8, 15 and 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men. How many men were there supposed to be in the temple? How many elders? Twenty-five? Twenty-four. So one... Is there that should not be. And he's made an influence on all the others. So look what they've done. With their backs toward the temple of God. Who do they have their backs toward? God. And their faces toward the east. What rises in the east in Canada? When you look at the east, what rises here in the east? The sun. And they worship the sun toward the east. Muslims. As I go to different airports around the world, I always look for a little chapel in the airports to pray. I pray, Lord, please spare my life as I get on this plane. And I always see in these airports rugs, little rugs or mats showing Mecca, where the Muslims come, they take off their shoes and they, they kneel and they pray towards Mecca. But here, they're praying towards the sun, towards the sun. This implies Sunday law. That is the second great crisis Sister White talks about. She talks about a crisis of war that already happened. A reform would come in a crisis of war. And then she talks about a crisis of Sunday law. Where she says a loud cry. Where she says latter rain. Where she says shaking. There's a shaking before. Shaking starts and continues. Does not start. Stop. It gets worse as we get to the end. In terms of the shaking, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Now, in chapter 9, what do we have? We have the sealing message. This is the sealing of the living. The sealing of the dead started in 1844. So this is the sealing of the living. After this great abomination, Sunday law is out. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry. They cry for all the abominations. Which is the abomination they're crying for most of all? Sunday law. We just read it in chapter 8. In verse 15. Let's read chapter 8 of Ezekiel, verse 15. And thou shalt see greater abominations than these. What is the greater abomination? They put their backs towards the Lord and they worship the sun. They worship the sun on Sunday, the day of the sun. Sontag. Taitan. In Greek, adds up to 666. The name of the sun in Greek is 666. And now, God's people, Jerusalem is a symbol of God's people. This man with the ink horn, this is a special seal. Brother Timo has taught this very clearly. The seal of the law is the Sabbath. But this is a special seal for the living. God's name is placed on the forehead. And the new name of Jesus is placed on the forehead of the living. Sealing of the living. In the midst of Jerusalem set a mark upon their foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. In the midst of what? Of Jerusalem. Of Adventism. 
Who knows? Maybe even in the reform, some ministers would turn aside and say, "No, what you do, like Brother Cholich used to say, you go to." He would give this example. He says many Adventists are going to work in the post office, and they well, what they will do is they'll take their Sabbath school, and while they sell the stamps, they study the Sabbath school, I'm keeping the Sabbath. They're not keeping it holy. They're not making a separation between the holy and the unholy. They're making no difference. They're profaning the holy day of God. During World War I, if you read the minutes, you can get online and read the minutes of the General Conference of the Nominal Church when World War I came to the United States. The members of the General Conference decided, and they published, in the Review and Herald, I have it, I didn't bring it now, you can look it up on, on the web, it's all there, that the courageous is saying, no, you can't have the ceiling now, because the testimonies say that the ceiling is going to be in the future, and they're right, it is in the future, but they're wrong in saying you can't be sealed now. The ceiling started in 1844, the sealing of the dead. And Sister White says there are some people over the age of 90 that have already received the seal of God. But the sealing of the living has to be before the latter rain, the sealing of the living in God's church. And it continues. Once the sealing starts, it doesn't end until the last one is sealed. And it says the living righteous will receive the seal of God prior to the close of probation. Now the sign or seal of God is revealed in the observance of the seventh day Sabbath, the Lord's memorial of creation. The mark of the beast is the opposite of this, the observance of the first day of the week. Do we have the mark of the beast today? No. No. We don't. No. Sunday keeping is not yet the mark of the beast, she says. And will not be until the decree goes forth, causing men to worship this idol Sabbath. The time will come when this day will be the test, but that time has not come yet. No one has yet received the mark of the beast. The testing time has not yet come. There are true Christians in every church not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. I try to understand it like this, not to be confused with all the last day events. When the mark of the beast is out, the seal of God is out. Amen. Same time. Seal of the living. Do you put the mark of the beast on the dead? No. You seal the living. When God starts sealing the living, he's finished. All the dead, they're done. He's done. He's ready to come. But this is the good paragraph here. It says... None are condemned until they have had the light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. So you cannot receive the mark of the beast until you hear first about the Sabbath and about Jesus. But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and his image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. The devil sends Sunday law, God sends loud cry. The devil says, let every man, woman, and child worship on Sunday. God sends this powerful message to reinforce the third angel, which is another, the last phase of the third angel, which is the last phase of the other angel, of this reform movement. Having received the latter rain to give the last cry, the loud cry, don't worship the image. The message doesn't change, it's the same. Don't worship the image. Don't receive the mark. By its name you can identify the beast and his day and the mark of his authority. Now Sister White says, I'll read it. Again, it says, But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and his image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. 
If the light of truth has been presented to you, revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, and showing that there is no foundation in the word of God for Sunday observance, and yet you still cling to the false Sabbath, refusing to keep the holy Sabbath which God calls my holy day, you receive the mark of the beast. And then she says the question, when does this take place? When you obey the decree that commands you to cease from labor on Sunday and worship God, well, you know that there is not a word in the Bible showing that Sunday to be other than a common working day. You consent to receive the mark of the beast and refuse the seal of God. Now, how can you refuse the seal of God if no sealing is taking place? You can only refuse it if it's taking place. The mark of the beast is taking place. The last seal of God is taking place for the living. In a little while, she says it'll happen. What book is that? That's um, Maranatha, page 211 and 212. Now, the past is a predictor of the future. What came first, early rain or the cross? What came first? The cross came first. And then Pentecost, the tongues of fire. And then what did they do? They had this great missionary zeal to preach the word. And as Brother Jerry said, they were first needed to be united. They were united in mind. They were united in heart. They were united in place. They were united in doctrine. They had confessed their sins. Sister White tells about one meeting in Testimonies to the Church Volume 8 where she saw the latter rain and she says it was a gathering and people got up one by one and they started to confess their sins saying, I'm sorry, God. I'm very sorry. Brother Jerry, please forgive me. I really didn't mean to do that. And, okay. and they forgave, just like he forgave, forgives me right now. Helen, please, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. And others started to get up to say that they were sorry confessing their sins. And then they received power. They received power from on high. The lack of rain fell down. And they started to preach the word. And then Sister White woke up. And she was told to write, This could have been. This could have been. But they weren't ready. It didn't fall. Reformation tried to start within the Adventist church. And what did they do? They threw it out. 1914. You try to do Reformation in any nominal church today, you'll be put out. The same way. Now let's read it in the book of Acts, please. In the book of Acts, what happened? Acts chapter 4, verse 31 through 34. So we want to go to the second question now in terms of what is what is this loud cry? What happens? What are the characteristics? Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. And it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Now that prayer. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in unity. God's people will be shaken. Where they were assembled together and they were all filled of the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. The loud cry gives us the ability to preach the word of God. But we cannot come till we receive latter rain. And we can't receive latter rain until we receive the seal of God. And the seal of God is indelible. It cannot be removed. And if we have one sin, we cannot receive the seal of God. Now it says in verse 32, I'm reading Acts chapter 4, verse 32, And the multitude of them that believe were of one heart and of one soul, that unity that Christ prayed for, that we spoke about yesterday. Unity in works of mercy, unity in the fruit of the Spirit and the character of Jesus. One heart and one soul, body, mind, and spirit. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they held all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness. This great power. 
We saw it in the midnight cry, we will see it in the loud cry. Gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. This is a further measure of grace. We do have grace today. We do have power today. We have a witness. But it will be greater then. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses. That's proof. But there were people in the time of the early reign that had houses. Otherwise, they could not have sold them. And that was a time to sell them. Houses, not one house, but houses. And brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. During this time of the latter reign, during this time of the loud cry, the third angel that swells into a loud cry, they are of one heart and one mind. They speak the word with boldness. They have great power to witness. They have great grace. They sell their possessions to finance the missionary work. It will be so in the end of time. Now let's read specifically where the Bible says about this loud cry. In Revelation chapter 14, please. Revelation 14, verse, Revelation 14, verse 9, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, now, when the third angel started in 1844, how many Adventists were there that remained from the quarter of a million people? About 50. 40, 50, 60 people. That's all. About 50 people. And yet it says with a loud voice. They weren't in every country. And yet it says here with a loud voice. Because it will swell to a loud voice. Now, if you keep reading here in Revelation chapter 14, we read in verse 18, And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now that, there are many loud cries in the Bible. That's the loud cry to gather all of the unfaithful for the lake of fire. For the lake of fire. But this loud cry, this loud voice is part of the third angel's message. We see it again in Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. And after these things, verse 1, I saw another angel. An angel is a messenger. It represents a group of people that are preaching the word of God. So it is a movement. The first angel's message was the Millerite movement. Second, under William Miller, the second angel's message was under Samuel Snow. It was later also called the Seventh Month Movement, and the Midnight Cry was part of it. And the third angel's message was the Seventh-day Adventist. The fourth angel's message is another angel. I believe it to be the Reform Movement. And it says, An other angel came down from having, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. That's the loud cry, verse 2, with a loud voice, mightily. But notice there are three characteristics, the light. Sister White says that the revelation of Jesus Christ was the light. Read it in Testimony Ministers. That is the beginning of the light that is going to illuminate the world, 1888. That's the beginning. There were reformers. And the reformers were Jones and Wagner and Ellen G. White. And the message of Christ and righteousness was refused nearly by all. So the beginning of the light, she says, was 1888. With the message of Christ and righteousness at Minneapolis. I was in Minneapolis in 1988, 100 years later. Ralph Larson was there. He was preaching. And I went to the church elder and I said, Please, where is the original church of Minneapolis? And he gave me the address. And I went there. You know what it is today? Or what it was 100 years later? You're very close. 
adult. Um, <laughs> Just about. It was an adult entertainment place, an adult video. X, X, X. At the same location. It's been fulfilled, what it says here. The habitation of devils. The same place where the great where Jesus wanted to come and pour out the latter rain. Sister White says that the Lord was about to pour out the latter rain. That's where it is today. They still have the pulpit, the original pulpit, there at the Minneapolis church. But that was the beginning of the light. And you had the reform inside the church. Wagner and Jones and these people later left the church. But the message continued. Our next date is 1914. When you see... When it's thundering and there's lightning, do you hear the thunder first or do you see the light first? Because light travels faster. So it's likewise here. You see the light first. That was the light of the lightning. And then in 1914, you hear the voice, Come out of her, my people. Now the lightning does not stop. And the voice does not stop. The lightning is going to be more powerful and the voice louder as we reach the time of end. The thunder. That was 1914. God raised Otto Welp. He raised Deutschler. You know, from Germany, from, from Holland. And they were disfellowshipped with their entire churches. Many of you probably remember Oscar Kramer. He's written a booklet. Oscar Kramer. He was his fellowship with his mom from the church. He didn't, they didn't want to leave. They were protesting against the involvement of the Seventh-day Adventists in war in August of 1914. Started in Europe. America didn't enter until the 1917. And if you read the, the book by Dr. Miller, who was a worker of the Seventh-day Adventists, who was this fellowship, and Daniels, the president of the General Conference, literally went to him and told him that he was causing division. And yet this brother was reading in the testimonies, you, we can't go to war. There were a group of young people in Washington, D.C., it's in Miller's book. It's in Andrews University. Brother Cholich found it and he published it and you can buy it from Religious Liberty. Maybe you have it also here in Canada. We do. Yes, you do. Okay, excellent. So you can order it here also from the Canadian Messenger. In that booklet, Miller says, listen to this, brother. Miller says that the young people in Washington, D.C. wrote to the General Conference and said, please help us. We don't want to be drafted. And the JC did not help them. They were drafted. They were drafted, they went to France. What the JC did was it converted all their major institutions into training grounds for medics. And those that took arms were not as fellowship. That's the voice. The voice. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, John the Baptist. Sister White says in councils and diets and food that John the Baptist was a reformer. The voice is a symbol of the reform. It's a symbol of John the Baptist. It's a symbol of Elijah. The Elijah message. A voice. Are you that man? No, I'm not. Are you Jeremiah? No. What are you? John says, I'm just a voice. I'm just the voice for God here. Repeating what he has shown me in the Bible, in the Testament. We are the voice crying out in the wilderness. Now there's a third phase. And that's, so we have the cry, so the voice, we saw the lightning, and then the great power. That's the loud cry. That is to come. And when the great power comes, Miracles will be wrought because of the latter rain. The gospel will be preached in all the world. People will be converted by thousands. It doesn't say millions. It millions, but millions are converted. It doesn't say millions. It says thousands of people were out. Thousands were converted. They will be doing medical missionary work. They will be running to and fro as the Spirit takes them. And Sister White says in early writings, page 278, the last group that hears the message are the slaves. 
Los, que los últimos que escucharon esa son los esclavos. There was slavery in her time. Hubo esclavitud en su tiempo. There are slave, there's slavery today. Now how can we prove that there's going to be slavery here on Sunday law? Here it is. Revelation chapter 14. Chapter uh, 13. Revelation chapter 13. Verse 16, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Bond means slave. There will be slavery again. There is slavery right now. But it speaks about slavery. And Sister White says that the last group to hear the loud cry will be the slaves. Go to places in Africa. They still have slavery. Maritania. You eat chocolate, for example. They use slaves to gather chocolate. Child slaves, that's right. Child slaves to gather the cocoa beans to make chocolate. That's why many people protest. I've written letters to the United Nations and everything. How can you allow in West Africa child slavery to gather these cocoa beans? Well, there's a demand for it. There will be a great awakening, a mass preaching all over the world. Can we read what Colossians says? Colossians chapter 1, as in the time of the apostles, Paul could write that every living creature under heaven had heard the message. Every living creature. Colossians chapter 1 verse 5 and 6. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, wherefore ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. We go to verse 23. Colossians 1.23 If ye continue in faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am made minister. That's wonderful. To every creature. The nominal Adventist church has claimed they have reached every country now in the world. They haven't reached every city and town. I'm about to finish. Read, read this. Early writings, page 261. 262. Let me read Maranatha first. Maranatha, page 27. During the loud cry, the church, aided by the providential interpositions of her exalted Lord, will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly that light will be communicated to every city and town. Every city and town. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of salvation. Because every city and town will get Sunday law. So every city and town must hear the message. The third angel's message. And the other angel's message that Babylon is fallen. And this other angel is not just repeating the second angel's message, but it's adding all of the other churches who did not fall under the second angel have now fallen. Except God's true remnant. And that started in 18... Well, the voice started in 1914. Now I'll read what Ernie Wright says. She says, I saw that God has honest children among the nominal Adventists. When she wrote this, it was first day Adventist. But she's looking into the future. Seventh day Adventists will become first day Adventists. We see them going in that trend. They removed the name Seventh Day from the Review and Herald. It's now called the Adventist Review. The celebration movement is like a Pentecostal movement within many churches. I saw that God has honest people among nominal Adventists and the fallen churches. And before the plague shall be poured out, ministers and people will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. Satan knows this, and before the loud cry of the third angel is given, he raises excitement in these religious bodies, like he does today. But the light will shine, and all who are honest will leave the fallen churches and take their stand with the remnant. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. My time is up.
and I want to tell you what happened about four years ago. We received a letter at the, at the General Conference of this Reform Movement from the Law Department of the Nano Adventist Church that they were going to sue us, intention to sue us, to take us to court. Over the name, they said they wanted me to sign a paper and we would not use the name Seventh-day Adventist again. I called the committee of General Conference and started to pray and I called the lawyer y llamé a un abogado le dije recibí esta carta y no la puedo firmar y no la voy a firmar porque somos los verdaderos adventistas y nos has dado este nombre en su enciclopedia en su enciclopedia quiero darles algunas referencias ustedes nos llaman 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 ustedes written by your research department, your ministerial department, then we are the reform movement. And then she says to me, no, no, you're the people that separate. I says, who told you that? Oh, the people in Roanoke told us that you separated recently from them. I said, no, look at these references. And, and please, if you want to sue us, go ahead. It'll be the greatest help you will give the reform movement. Because people don't know us. We're a secret. People don't know about the reform movement. We have a hard time letting Adventists know. Let me tell you what's going to happen within your church. A whole bunch of honest Adventists are going to rise up and protest. Why are you suing this little church that's trying to live the message and preach the gospel that you people aren't doing? They're going to rise up. That will be the best publicity you give us. The best marketing. I can see all the papers going ahead and publishing. Adventists sue each other. And all the papers. What great publicity that will do for your church. He says, sir, that's enough. You want me to give you more references? And that's it. That ended. Now I heard through the grapevine that it was Ruth Jennings who called Helen Kramer who called the General Conference of the Nominal Name, they exist way before. You patented the name, their grandfather did. El nombre ya es utilizado antes, adventistas. Listen, we've had these great competitions in the Olympics, competition. Competidores. And I want to tell you Yo that there was one man that was faster than que, any of these new athletes. Que fue muy rápido, más rápido que los nuevos atletas de hoy en día en los Olímpicos. He ran faster than horses. Corría más rápido que los caballos. His name was Elijah. Su nombre era Elías. Ahab had horses, the fastest horses Ahab owned, and his chariot. Rápidos. And it was raining, and it was storming, corriendo. and Elijah ran faster than the horses, y the lightning, and the thunder was there, and la Elijah lluvia. was running, leading the king to his home. He was faster. You know how far it is from Tell us. 44 kilometers, a marathon. Kilómetros, una maratón. A marathon he ran. In the rain, no umbrella. In the thunder, in the lightning. Faster than horses. There is no man that can run faster than horses. No man. Except Elijah. The reform is Elijah. Y Elías, nosotros somos ese Elías. Dios es mi. Jehová es mi Dios. Upon God's people. See, we need the latter rain. We, we don't have all the funds and the money to proclaim the gospel. We're trying to do the best we can with the little we have, and we need your help. We need to be united on doctrine and truth. And the spirit is more important than being right, having the right spirit. And we want to be the Elijah. Behold, I will send Elijah before the last and great day, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. It starts at home. The loud cry has to be felt at home. A spiritual loud cry we need today. In our homes, in prayer, in unity. Bringing our children to the truth. For his glory. Preparing for the great run. You want to say something, Brother Chester? Yeah, I want to... You were saying now when no one received the mark until the decree. That's what Sister White says. I didn't make that up. I read it from the testimony. And, and so the sealing, though, uh, is, is, is still can be sealed now, right? 
You can be sealed, and God has a special seal, and the seal is revealed in the keeping of the Sabbath, but the sealing of God in the end time for the living is not yet. But the seal of the third angel we do have that's binding them. Sister White says the third angel is binding them in bondages. Yes, it is 144,000, but that's another issue. 144,000 started in 1844, but that's another study. But the 144,000 are sealed that are dead. But our emphasis here is the loud cry. Loud cry is part of the Revelation 18. Just one more. Yes. Now, the Avengers, uh, like we read the testimony, they, they preach in the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is the seal, how they understand it. And, and, but uh, Sister White have a, a test, testimony in Volume 1, says some people accept the Sabbath, but they reject the third angel's message. Okay. That's true. There are people that have accepted the Sabbath today, but they don't really keep the Sabbath. I mean, I've spoken to many Sabbatarian groups. Brother Watts and I have visited them in, in Africa. They don't keep the Sabbath the way we do. They keep it the way Sunday keepers keep Sunday. Yes? Because I, I always hear people say, that I keep the Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath. Okay. And I always refer them back to the point, but you didn't finish the statement. You don't keep the Sabbath holy. That's it. You just keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't keep it around here to keep the Sabbath, but you don't keep it holy. That's a whole different. That's a whole different. <laughs> Everyone who keeps the Sabbath holy will be sealed. And there are 144,000 that are sealed. Um, I spoke to a brother from Pakistan. He says, brother, I understand we only have room for a few people in Pakistan. I said, brother, don't worry about that. You know, that number will take care of itself. You can have thousands of believers in Pakistan. God will save his own. Yes, Brother Peter. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, he did. And he failed. He was not invincible. And that woman represents Babylon. And many of God's people will be frightened and run away. But the story doesn't end there. Amen. Yes, Elijah received food from on high. And he, he even fell asleep. We're now in the tarrying time that the virgins fall asleep. But Elijah woke up. We know the story. And he went back. He went back and spoke to that king, and he didn't fear that woman anymore. Yes? And he finished his mission, he's in heaven. He was translated. He was translated without seeing death, praise the Lord. Yes. And the Bible says that we have like passions with Elijah. We're like Elijah. We can get down. So that's a message of hope for us. Amen. That if I have left, I can come back. There are testimonies here I didn't have time to read. That many that have left will return during this time of the latter, the loud cry. She says that. Now, many that have been disappointed will come back. But that doesn't mean I'm going to wait. I have a relative that tells me, look, I know you got the truth. But I want to wait till it's almost all over. Then you let me know Pero no tenemos que esperar a cuando llegue ese momento. Tenemos que hacer nuestro nuestra parte. He may not be alive. Now Jesus can come for me today, for you. We don't know what's our time alive here on earth. If we die, that's it, brother. Sunday, forget Sunday law. Right now, it's my relationship with Jesus. I don't know how long I'll be alive or what. If an accident happens and you end up like a vegetable, or you're assassinated, or, or whatever. So many things happen. So we need to be today. Today is the day of the Lord. Today is the day we need to come uh, with him. And to be of one mind and one heart with Jesus. And we'll be one heart and one mind with each other. Amen. 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 Brother Timo, will you lead us in prayer, please?